Hello everyone and a warm welcome to the module devoted to the methods used to determine the structures of organic molecules. We spent the vast majority of the introductory module on organic chemistry learning how to draw organic molecules realistically. Now we need to answer the questions. What is realistic? How do we know what structures molecules actually have? Make no mistake about these important points. We really do know what shape molecules have. You would not be far wrong if you said that the single most important development in organic chemistry in modern times is just this certainty, as well as the speed with which we can be certain about the structure of newly developed organic compounds. What has caused this revolution can be stated in a word, spectroscopy. I will first consider structure determination as a whole and then introduce four different methods, including X-ray crystallography, used to determine bond lengths and angles, mass spectrometry, determining the mass of the molecule and atomic composition, and nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR, spectroscopy, which tells us about symmetry, branching, and connectivity in the molecule. Infrared spectroscopy is also used to identify the functional groups in the molecule. Of these, NMR is more important than all the rest put together, so we shall return to it in more detail in a separate module. After we have discussed a wider range of molecules, there will be a review module to bring the ideas together and show you how unknown structures are really determined. Note that this is just an introductory module on the methods for determining the structure of organic molecules. If you would like more details on any of the spectroscopic methods we discuss, you should refer to more specialized courses on spectroscopy. Until the second half of the 20th century, the structure of a substance, a newly discovered natural product, for example, was determined using information obtained from chemical reactions. This information included the identification of functional groups by chemical tests along with the results of experiments in which the substance was broken down into smaller, more readily identifiable fragments. Typical of this approach is the demonstration of the presence of a double bond in an alkene by catalytic hydrogenation and determination of its location by ozonolysis. After considering all the available chemical evidence, the chemist proposed a candidate structure, or structures, consistent with the observations. Proof of structure was provided either by converting the substance to some already known compound or by an independent synthesis. These procedures are not sufficient, however, for complex compounds that have never been synthesized and characterized. They are also impractical with compounds that are difficult to obtain because a relatively large sample is required to complete the elemental analysis and all the functional group tests. We needed analytical techniques that work with tiny samples and that do not damage the sample in any way. For these reasons, qualitative tests and chemical degradation have given way to instrumental methods of structure determination. As diverse as these techniques are, all of them are based on the absorption of energy by a molecule and all measure how a molecule responds to that absorption. While describing spectroscopic techniques, in this course the emphasis will be on their application to structure determination. In the introductory module on organic chemistry, I suggested that you draw saturated carbon chains as zigzags rather than in straight lines with 90 degree or 180 degree bond angles. This recommendation is based on our knowledge that these chains have a zigzag structure. The X-ray crystal structure of the straight chain deacid hexanedioic acid, is shown below. You can clearly observe the zigzag chain, the planar carboxylic acid groups, and even the orientation of hydrogen atoms, whether they are coming towards you or going away from you. Drawing this molecule realistically, as shown in the second drawing above, is evidently more accurate. X-ray crystal structures are determined by allowing a sample of a crystalline compound to diffract X-rays. From the resulting diffraction pattern, it is possible to deduce the precise spatial arrangement of the atoms in the molecule. Usually, hydrogen atoms are exceptions as they are too light to diffract the X-rays, and their positions must be inferred from the rest of the structure. There is one question that X-ray answers better than any other method. What shape does a molecule have? Another important problem it can solve is the structure of an important new unknown compound. There are subterranean bacteria, for example, that use methane as an energy source. 
It is amazing that bacteria can convert methane into anything useful, and, of course, chemists really wanted to know how they did it. In 1979, it was found that the bacteria use a coenzyme, given the trivial name methoxidin, to oxidize methane to methanol. Coenzymes are biochemical reagents that work hand-in-hand -hand with enzymes to catalyze reactions. Methoxidin was a new compound with an unknown structure and could be obtained in only very small amounts. It proved exceptionally difficult to solve the structure by NMR. But eventually, methoxidin was found by X-ray crystallography to be a polycyclic tricarboxylic acid. If X-ray crystallography is so powerful, why do we bother with other methods? Well, there are two reasons. First and foremost, X-ray crystallography works by the scattering of X-rays from electrons and requires crystalline solids. If an organic compound is a liquid or is a solid but does not form good crystals, its structure cannot be determined in this way. Additionally, X-ray crystallography is a science in its own right, requiring specialized skills, and a structure determination can take a long time. Modern methods have reduced this time to a matter of hours or less. A modern NMR machine with a robot attachment can run more than 100 spectra overnight by contrast. Therefore, we typically use NMR routinely and reserve X-rays for difficult unknown structures and for determining the detailed shape of important molecules. Because it cannot usually see hydrogen atoms, it is important to appreciate that X-ray crystallography is not infallible. It can still get things wrong. A famous example is the antibiotic diazonamide A, which from 1991, when it was isolated from a marine organism, until 2001, when the error was realized, was thought to have the structure shown here. It has the same mass as the real structure on the left, and X-ray crystallography was unable to tell the oxygen and the nitrogen apart. Only when the compound was synthesized did the error become apparent. And the fact that the correct structure was indeed that on the left was confirmed by the fact that synthetic material of this structure made in 2002 was identical with the natural product. As for the practicality of determining the structure of organic molecules, consider yourself in these situations regularly encountered by professional chemists. You notice an unexpected product from a chemical reaction, or you discover a previously unknown compound in a plant extract. You may also detect a suspected food contaminant and need to identify it. Finally, you are routinely checking purity during the manufacture of a drug. In all cases, except perhaps the second, you would need a quick and reliable answer. Suppose you are trying to identify the heart drug propranolol. You would first want to know the molecular weight and atomic composition, and these would come from a mass spectrum. Propranolol has a relative molecular mass of 259 in the composition, C16H21NO2. Next, you would need the carbon skeleton. This would come from NMR, which would reveal the three fragments shown here. NMR does not literally break up the molecule into fragments, but it does view molecules as pieces of hydrocarbon linked together. There are many ways in which the fragments seen by NMR could be joined together, and at this stage you would have no idea whether the oxygen atoms were present as OH groups or as ethers, whether the nitrogen would be an amine or not, and whether Y and Z might or might not be the same atom, say nitrogen. More information comes from the infrared spectrum, which highlights the functional groups and which would show that there is an OH and an NH in the molecule, but no other functional groups such as nitrile or nitro. This still leaves a variety of possible structures, and these could finally be distinguished by the details revealed by proton NMR. We will deal with proton NMR only briefly in this module as it is more complicated than carbon NMR, but we will return to it later. In the following lectures, we must go through each of these methods and see how they give us information about the propranolol molecule. To sum it up, in this lecture, you have been introduced to the main topics that are going to be covered in the module devoted to the determination of the structure of organic molecules. I briefly discussed X-ray crystallography, highlighting its importance in determining the shape of organic compounds. I described the main limitations of X-ray crystallography and outlined the importance of spectroscopic methods and structure identification.
The following lecture will predominantly focus on the description of mass spectrometry and its application in elucidating the structure of organic molecules. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone and welcome back to the module on the determination of the structure of organic molecules. In the previous lecture, you were introduced to the principles of X-ray crystallography, its applications, and limitations. I concluded the lecture with an outline of structure determination by spectroscopy. This lecture will concentrate more on describing the main principles of mass spectrometry and its application in identifying the structure of organic compounds. Mass spectrometry is different from other forms of spectroscopy because it measures mass rather than the absorption of energy. It is not easy to weigh a neutral molecule, and a mass spectrometer works by measuring the mass of a charged ion instead. The charge makes the molecule controllable by an electric field. A mass spectrometer therefore has three basic components, something to volatilize and ionize the molecule into a beam of charged particles. Something to focus the beam so that particles of the same mass charge ratio are separated from all others, and something to detect the particles. All spectrometers in common use operate in a high vacuum and use one of several methods to convert neutral molecules into cations, the most common being electron impact, chemical ionization, and electrospray. In electron impact mass spectrometry, the molecule is bombarded with highly energetic electrons that knock a weakly bound electron out of the molecule. If you think this is strange, think of throwing bricks at a brick wall. The bricks cannot stick to the wall but can knock loose bricks off the top of the wall. Losing a single electron leaves behind an unpaired electron and a positive charge. The electron that is lost will be one of relatively high energy and typically one not involved in bonding for example an electron from a lone pair. These unstable species are known as radical cations. Most molecules have all their electrons paired. Radicals have unpaired electrons. Molecules that carry a negative charge are anions. Molecules with a positive charge are cations. Radical cations and radical anions are simply species that are both charged and have an unpaired electron. Being charged radical cations are accelerated by an electric field and focused onto the detector, which detects the mass of the ion by how far its path has been deflected by the electric field. It only takes about 20 microseconds for the radical cations to reach the detector, but sometimes they fragment before they get there, in which case other ions will also be detected. These fragments will always have a lower mass than the parent molecular ion. So in a typical mass spectrum, we are most interested in the heaviest ion we can see. A typical electron impact mass spectrum looks like this. This compound was identified as a pheromone deposited by worker bees when feeding as a marker to deter their colleagues from visiting the same, now depleted, nectar source. Only minute quantities are available for analysis, of course, but that does not matter. Mass spectrometry is successful even on a microgram scale. The spectrum you see here indicates that the molecule has a mass of 114 because that is the highest mass observed in the spectrum. The molecule is in fact the volatile ketone heptan 2 on, alternatively known as honeybee alarm pheromone. A problem with electron impact mass spectrometry is that, for fragile molecules, the energy of the bombarding electron can be sufficient to cause it to fragment completely, losing all trace of the molecular ion. If you're interested in how to use fragmentation patterns to establish structure, you should check specialized courses on mass spectrometry. Some useful information can be gained from fragmentation patterns, but in general it is more useful to aim to weigh the molecule all in one piece. This can be achieved using any of a number of other techniques, of which the most common are chemical ionization and electrospray. I will not be discussing ionization techniques in detail. It is sufficient for you to realize at this stage that there are several ways of ionizing a molecule gently so that its mass can be determined. Chemical ionization is achieved by mixing a gas such as ammonia with the substrate in the spectrometer. Bombardment of ammonia with electrons leads to formation of some ammonium cation by a proton transfer, and reaction of this ion with the substrate makes a charged complex which can be accelerated by the electric field. 
The masses observed by chemical ionization spectroscopy carried out in this way are usually M plus 1 or M plus 18 relative to the mass of the substrate. Here, M is the mass of the substrate, 1 is the mass of the extra proton, and 18 is the mass of ammonium cation bound to the molecule being analyzed. With electrospray mass spectrometry, an aerosol of the substrate is ionized with sodium ions or protons. This means that masses of M plus 1 and M plus 23 are often observed, where 1 corresponds to the mass of a proton and 23 is the mass of a sodium cation. Here is presented the electrospray mass spectrum of honeybee alarm pheromone hepton 2 on. Notice how a single molecular ion is clearly visible this time but it has a mass of 137, which is 23 more than the mass of 114. In other words, this is the mass of hepton 2 on plus the mass of sodium ion. Most elements can exist as more than one isotope. Usually, one isotope accounts for the vast majority, perhaps more than 99%, of the atoms of an element. But for some elements, atoms of several isotopes make up a significant proportion of the total in a sample. Chlorine, for example, is normally a 3 to 1 mixture of chlorine, 35, and chlorine, 37, hence the average relative atomic mass of chlorine is 35.5. Bromine, on the other hand, is an almost 1 to 1 mixture of bromine, 79, and bromine, 81, hence the average mass of bromine is 80. Since mass spectrometry weighs individual molecules, there is no averaging. Instead, it detects the true weight of each molecule, whatever isotope it contains. For example, the molecular ion in the electron impact mass spectrum of this aryl bromide has two peaks at 186 and 188 of roughly equal intensity. Having two molecular ions of equal intensity separated by two mass units is indicative of bromine in a molecule. The mass spectrum of a chlorine-containing molecule is likewise easy to identify from two peaks separated by two mass units, but this time in a ratio of 3 to 1, arising from the 3 to 1 isotopic ratio of chlorine, 35 and chlorine, 37. The behavior of molecules possessing more than one bromine or chlorine atom is illustrated here using the example of the painkiller diclofenac. This spectrum was obtained from commercial tablets which contain the potassium salt of the active ingredient. The electrospray mass spectrum shows the mass of the carboxylate anion as three peaks, at 294, 296, and 298. The relative size of the peaks can be determined based on the 75% probability that each chlorine atom will be chlorine-35 and the 25% probability that it will be chlorine-37. The minor isotopes of many elements that appear at below the 1% level are not usually important, but one we cannot ignore is the 1.1% of carbon, 13 present in ordinary carbon, of which the main isotope is of course carbon, 12. Another isotope, carbon, 14, is radioactive and used in carbon dating, but its natural abundance is minute. The stable isotope carbon-13 is not radioactive, but it is NMR active, as we shall soon see. In reality, the precise ratio of isotopes for any element varies according to its source, a fact which can supply useful forensic information. If you look back at all the mass spectra illustrated so far in this module, you will see a small peak one mass unit higher than each peak. These are peaks arising from molecules containing carbon-13 instead of carbon-12. The exact height of these peaks is useful as an indication of the number of carbon atoms in the molecule. Each carbon has a 1.1% chance of being carbon-13 rather than carbon-12, so the more carbon atoms there are the bigger this chance becomes. If there are n carbon atoms in a molecular ion, then the ratio of m plus to m plus 1 plus is calculated by this formula. Look at the spectrum shown here. It is the fuel additive topanol 354, whose structure and molecular formula are shown. With 15 carbons, there is a 16.5% chance there will be one carbon-13 atom in the molecule, and you can clearly see the sizable M plus 1, peak at 237. We can ignore the possibility of having two carbon-13 atoms in the molecule of topanol 354, 
as the probability of that, according to this formula, is extremely small. In airports, travelers are occasionally asked for a security check. During the screening process, a passenger's belongings may be swabbed with a wand to test for trace amounts of explosives and drugs. The swabs are analyzed by an instrument known as an ion mobility spectrometer, which can quickly determine whether explosives or other unwanted substances are present in the swab. To detect trace amounts of explosives, the swab is inserted into the ion mobility spectrometer. Any explosives on the swab are vaporized by a heater and drawn into the ionization region of the instrument. The ions then enter the drift region, where they are separated in an electric field and detected at a charge collector plate at the end. Algorithms then analyze row responses to determine the presence of dangerous substances from benign compounds also collected in the swab. Ordinary mass spectra tell us the molecular weight of the molecule. We could easily see, for example, that the B pheromone had molecular weight 114 even without knowing its structure. When I revealed it as C7H14O, I had to use other information to infer this, because 114 could also be many other things, such as C8H18, or C6H10O2, or C6H14N2. These different atomic compositions for the same molecular weight can nonetheless be distinguished if we know the exact molecular weight, since individual isotopes have non-integral masses, except carbon-12 by definition. The reason that exact masses are not integers lies in the slight mass difference between a proton and a neutron, and in the fact that electrons have a mass. This table gives these masses to five decimal places, which is the sort of accuracy you need for meaningful results. Such accurate mass measurements are obtained by a technique called high-resolution mass spectrometry. For the B pheromone, the accurate mass turns out to be 114.1039. The table below compares possible atomic compositions for an approximate molecular weight 114, and the result is conclusive. The exact masses to three places of decimals fit the observed exact mass only for the composition, C7H14O. You may not think the fit is very good when you look at the two numbers, but notice the difference in the error expressed as parts per million. One answer stands out from the rest. Note that even two places of decimals would be enough to distinguish these four compositions. In the rest of the course, whenever I state that a molecule has a certain atomic composition, you can assume that it has been determined by high resolution mass spectrometry on the molecular ion. One thing you may have noticed in this table is that there are no entries with just one nitrogen atom. Two nitrogen atoms, yes, one nitrogen, no. This is because any complete molecule with carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and just one nitrogen in it has an odd molecular weight. The reason for this is that carbon, oxygen, sulfur, and nitrogen all have even atomic weights and only hydrogen has an odd atomic weight. Nitrogen is the only element from carbon, oxygen, and sulfur that can form an odd number of bonds, three in fact. Therefore, molecules with one nitrogen atom must have an odd number of hydrogen atoms and hence an odd molecular weight. Altogether, molecules with an odd molecular weight must have an odd number of nitrogen atoms and molecules with even molecular weight must have an even number of nitrogen atoms or none. To sum it up, in this lecture, you were introduced to the main concepts of mass spectrometry, which is used to measure the mass of organic molecules. We learned about the main ionization methods used in mass spectrometry and saw the usefulness of this method in detecting isotopes and determining the atomic composition of chemicals. In the following lecture, I will provide a basic introduction to the use of nuclear magnetic resonance for determining the structure of organic compounds. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the series of lectures focused on the main spectroscopic techniques used in the determination of the structure of organic molecules. So far, I have mainly concentrated on the description of X-ray crystallography and mass spectrometry, which are powerful tools for determining the shape and weight of organic compounds.
In this lecture, my aim will be to give you a general introduction to the most important physico-chemical technique used to describe the structure of organic molecules. I am speaking about nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, commonly abbreviated as NMR. Nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR, allows us to detect atomic nuclei and say what sort of environment they are in within the molecule. In a molecule such as propanol, the hydrogen atom of the hydroxyl group is clearly different from the hydrogen atoms of its carbon skeleton. It can be displaced by sodium metal, for example. Proton NMR can easily distinguish between these two sorts of hydrogens by detecting the environment the hydrogen's nucleus finds itself in. Moreover, NMR can also distinguish between all the other different sorts of hydrogen atoms present. Likewise, carbon NMR can easily distinguish between the three different carbon atoms in the molecule of propanol. NMR is extremely versatile. It can even scan living human brains, but the principle is still the same, being able to detect nuclei, and hence atoms, in different environments. When NMR is used medically, it is usually called magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, for fear of alarming patients wary of all things nuclear. Imagine for a moment that we were able to switch off the Earth's magnetic field. Navigation would be made much harder since all compasses would be useless, with their needles pointing randomly in any direction. However, as soon as we switched the magnetic field back on, they would all point north, their lowest energy state. Now if we wanted to force a needle to point south, we would have to use up energy and, of course, as soon as we let go, the needle would return to its lowest energy state, pointing north. In a similar way, some atomic nuclei act like tiny compass needles when placed in a magnetic field and have different energy levels according to the direction in which they are pointing. I will explain how a nucleus can point somewhere in a moment. A real compass needle can rotate through 360 degrees and has an essentially infinite number of different energy levels, all higher in energy than the ground state pointing north. Fortunately, things are simpler with an atomic nucleus. Its energy levels are quantized, just like the energy levels of an electron, and it can adopt only certain specific energy levels. The atomic nucleus is like a compass which points, say, only north or south, and nothing in between. Just as a compass needle has to be made of a magnetic material to feel the effect of the Earth's magnetism, so it is that only certain nuclei are magnetic. Many, including normal carbon-12, do not interact with a magnetic field at all and cannot be observed in an NMR machine. But the minor carbon isotope, carbon-13, does display magnetic properties, as does hydrogen-1 or protium, the most abundant atomic nucleus on Earth. When a carbon-13 or protium atom finds itself in a magnetic field, it has two available energy states. It can either align itself with the field, which would be the lowest energy state, or against the field, which is higher in energy. The property of a nucleus that allows magnetic interactions, or in other words, the property possessed by carbon-13 and hydrogen-1 but not by carbon-12, is called spin. If you conceive of a carbon-13 and hydrogen-1 nucleus spinning, you can see how the nucleus can point in one direction. It is the axis of the spin that is aligned with or against the field. Let us return to the compass for a moment. If you want to move a compass needle away from pointing north, you must push it and expend energy as you do so. If you put the compass next to a bar magnet, the attraction towards the magnet is much greater than the attraction towards the north pole and the needle now will point at the magnet. You also must push much harder to move the needle from the magnet. Exactly how hard it is to turn the compass needle depends on how strong the magnetic field is and how well it is magnetized. If it is only weakly magnetized, it is much easier to turn it round, and if it is not magnetized at all, it is free to rotate. Likewise, for a nucleus in a magnetic field, the difference in energy between the nuclear spin aligned with and against the applied field depends on how strong the magnetic field is and the magnetic properties of the nucleus itself. The stronger the magnetic field, the greater the energy difference between the two alignments of the nucleus. Now there is an unfortunate thing about NMR. The energy difference between the nuclear spin being aligned with the magnetic field and against it is exceedingly small.
so small that we need an extraordinarily strong magnetic field to see any difference at all. This picture shows a typical NMR instrument. The fat cylinder is a supercooled magnet. The device hanging over it is an automatic sample changer and the console in the foreground controls the machine. NMR machines contain very strong electromagnets. The Earth's magnetic field has a field strength of between 30 and 60 microtesla. A typical magnet used in an NMR machine has a field strength of between 2 and 10 tesla, some 10 rays to the power of 5 times stronger than the Earth's field. These magnets are dangerous, and no metal objects must be taken into the rooms where they are. There are many stories about unwitting workers whose metal toolboxes have become firmly attached to NMR magnets. Even with the immensely powerful magnets used, the energy difference is still so small that the nuclei only have a very small preference for the lower energy state. Fortunately, we can just detect this small preference. A hydrogen-1 or carbon-13 nucleus in a magnetic field can have two energy levels, and energy is needed to flip the nucleus from the more stable state to the less stable state. But since the amount of energy needed is so small, it can be provided by low-energy electromagnetic radiation of radio wave frequency. Radio waves flip the nucleus from the lower energy state to the higher state. Turn off the radio pulse and the nucleus return to the lower energy state. When it does so, the energy comes out again. In this, a tiny pulse of radio frequency electromagnetic radiation is what we detect. We can now sum up how an NMR machine works. The sample of the unknown compound is dissolved in a suitable solvent, placed in a narrow tube, and put inside a very strong electromagnet. To even out imperfections in the sample, the tube is spun very fast by a stream of air. Inside the magnetic field, any atomic nuclei with a nuclear spin now possesses different energy levels, the exact number of different energy levels depending on the value of the nuclear spin. For proton and carbon NMR, there are two energy levels. Inside the NMR machine, the sample is irradiated with a short pulse of radio frequency energy. This disturbs the equilibrium balance between the two energy levels. Some nuclei absorb the energy and are promoted to a higher energy level. When the pulse finishes, the radiation given out as the nuclei fall back down to the lower energy level is detected using what is basically a sophisticated radio receiver. Finally, after lots of computation, the results are displayed in the form of number of absorptions against frequency. Here is an example, which we shall return to in more detail later. In the spectrum you see here, each peak represents a different kind of carbon atom. Each one absorbs energy or resonates at a different frequency. But why should carbon atoms be different? I have told you two factors that affect the energy difference, and therefore the frequency, these were the magnetic field strength and what sort of nucleus is being studied. So, you might expect all carbon nuclei to resonate at one particular frequency and all protons to resonate at one, but different frequency. But as you can see on this spectrum, they do not. The variation in frequency for different carbon atoms must mean that the energy jump from nucleus aligned with to nucleus aligned against the applied magnetic field must be different for each type of carbon atom. The reason is that the carbon-13 nuclei in question experience a magnetic field that is not quite the same as the magnetic field that we apply. Each nucleus is surrounded by electrons, and in a magnetic field these will set up a tiny electric current. This current will set up its own magnetic field, rather like the magnetic field set up by the electrons of an electric current moving through a coil of wire, which will oppose the magnetic field that we apply. The electrons are said to shield the nucleus from the external magnetic field. If the electron distribution varies from carbon atom to carbon atom, so does the local magnetic field experienced by its nucleus, and so does the corresponding resonating frequency. This variation in frequency is known as the chemical shift. Its symbol is the Greek letter delta. As an example, consider ethanol. The red carbon attached to the OH group will have a smaller share of the electrons around it compared to the green carbon since the oxygen atom is more electronegative and pulls electrons towards it, away from the red carbon atom. The magnetic field that the red carbon nucleus feels will therefore be slightly greater than that felt by the green carbon, which has a greater share of the electrons.
Since the red carbon is less shielded from the applied external magnetic field, we can call it deshielded. As the carbon attached to the oxygen feels a stronger magnetic field, there will be a greater energy difference between the two alignments of its nucleus. The greater the energy difference, the higher the resonant frequency as energy is proportional to the frequency. So, for ethanol, we would expect the red carbon, with the OH group attached, to resonate at a higher frequency than the green carbon. And indeed, this is exactly what the carbon NMR spectrum shows. The peaks at 77 ppm, shaded brown, are those of the usual solvent, deuterated chloroform, and can be ignored for the moment. I will explain them in the module devoted to further details of proton NMR spectroscopy. When you look at a real NMR spectrum, you will see that the scale does not appear to be in magnetic field units, nor in frequency, nor yet even energy units, but in parts per million ppm. There is a very good reason for this. The exact frequency at which the nucleus resonates depends on the external applied magnetic field. This means that if the sample is run on a machine with a different magnetic field, it will resonate at a different frequency. It would make life very difficult if we could not say exactly where our signal was, so we say how far it is from some reference sample as a fraction of the operating frequency of the machine. We know that all protons resonate at approximately the same frequency in a given magnetic field and that the exact frequency depends on what sort of chemical environment it is in which in turn depends on its electrons. This approximate frequency is the operating frequency of the machine and simply depends on the strength of the magnet. The stronger the magnet, the larger the operating frequency. The precise value of the operating frequency is simply the frequency at which a standard reference sample resonates. In everyday use, rather than referring to the magnet strength in Tesla, chemists usually refer to its operating frequency. A 9.4 Tesla NMR machine is referred to as a 400 MHz spectrometer since that is the frequency in this strength field at which the protons in the reference sample resonate. The compound we use as a reference sample is usually tetramethylsilane, TMS. This is a silane with each of the hydrogen atoms replaced by methyl groups. The four carbon atoms attached to silicon are all equivalent, and because silicon is more electropositive than carbon, they are fairly electron-rich or shielded. Silicon and oxygen have opposite effects on an adjacent carbon atom, electropositive silicon shields, electronegative oxygen D shields. Shielded methyl groups mean that they resonate at a frequency a little less than that of most organic compounds. This is useful because it means our reference sample is not right in the middle of our spectrum. The chemical shift, delta, in parts per million of a given nucleus in our sample is defined in terms of the resonance frequency by this equation. No matter what the operating frequency of the NMR machine, the signals in a given sample will always occur at the same chemical shifts. In ethanol, the carbon attached to the OH resonates at 58 ppm, whilst the carbon of the methyl group resonates at 18 ppm. Notice that by definition, TMS itself resonates at 0 ppm. The carbon nuclei in most organic compounds resonate at greater chemical shifts, normally between 0 and 200 ppm. Now, let's return to the sample spectrum of lactic acid, and you can see the features we have discussed. This is a 100 MHz spectrum. The horizontal axis is frequency but usually quoted in ppm of the magnets field. So each unit is 1 ppm of 100 MHz. We can tell immediately from the three peaks at 177, 66, and 20 ppm that there are three different types of carbon atom in the molecule. Again, ignore the brown solvent peaks at 77 ppm, they're of no interest to us now. You also need not worry about the fact that the signals have different intensities. This is a consequence of the way the spectrum was recorded and in carbon NMR spectra signal intensity is usually of no consequence. The strategies used to spot the identity of these signals will be described in the following lecture. To sum it up, in this lecture, we learned about the main principles of how nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy works. You have seen how the electronic environment around an NMR active nucleus affects the region where the signal corresponding to that nucleus appears.
We also learned about the internal standard tetramethylsilane used to standardize the work of various NMR machines operating under different frequencies. The following lecture will focus more on specific examples of organic molecules and their NMR spectra. You will be introduced to proton and carbon NMR spectroscopies. Your attention and participation are greatly appreciated. Hello everyone, and welcome to the second lecture designed to introduce you to the main concepts in nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. You should now know about the main principles of how the NMR machine works. You were also introduced to the main concepts allowing the rational interpretation of NMR spectra using the instance of carbon NMR of ethanol. Here, our main focus will be on the exploitation of the ideas learned in the previous lecture for the determination of the structure of simple organic molecules by carbon and proton NMR spectroscopies. The last spectrum I described in the previous lecture was the carbon NMR of lactic acid, also known as 2-hydroxypropanoic acid. Every time you move your fingers, you produce some lactic acid from glucose in the muscles of your arm. It is the breakdown product of glucose when you engage in anaerobic exercise. Each of lactic acid's carbon atoms gives a peak in a different region of the spectrum. But hang on one moment. You may say, don't we only see signals for carbon-13 nuclei and not carbon-12, which make up most of the carbon atoms in any normal sample of lactic acid? The answer is yes, and indeed only about 1.1% of the carbon atoms in any sample are visible by carbon NMR. But since those carbon-13 atoms will be distributed randomly through the sample, this does not affect any arguments about the spectrum's appearance. What it does mean, however, is that carbon NMR is not as sensitive as proton NMR, where essentially all of the hydrogen atoms in the sample will be visible. In fact, the low abundance of carbon-13 in natural carbon makes carbon spectra simpler than they would otherwise be. Accordingly, all carbon spectra can be divided into four major regions. These include saturated carbon atoms, 0 to 50 ppm, saturated carbon atoms next to oxygen, 50 to 100 ppm, unsaturated carbon atoms, 100 to 150 ppm, and unsaturated carbon atoms next to oxygen, like carbonyl groups, 150 to about 200 ppm. The chemical shift scale runs to the left from zero, where TMS resonates, backwards from the usual style. Chemical shift values around zero are obviously small but are confusingly called high field because this is the high magnetic field end of the scale. I suggest you say large or small chemical shift and large or small delta, but high or low field to avoid confusion. Alternatively, use upfield for high-frequency signals and downfield for low-frequency signals. Another helpful description I have already used is shielding. Each carbon nucleus is surrounded by electrons that shield the nucleus from the applied field. Simple saturated carbon nuclei are the most shielded. They have small chemical shifts between 0 and 50 ppm and resonate at high field. One electronegative oxygen atom moves the chemical shift downfield into the 50 to 100 ppm region. Unsaturated carbon atoms experience even less shielding between 100 and 150 ppm due to how electrons are distributed around the nucleus. You should know that unsaturated carbon atoms are more deshielded than saturated ones because a pi bond has a nodal plane, or a plane with no electron density at the nucleus. Electrons in pi bonds are less efficient at shielding the nucleus than electrons in sigma bonds. If unsaturated carbon atoms are also bonded to oxygen, then the nucleus is even more deshielded and moves to the largest chemical shifts around 200 ppm. So, onto some real carbon NMR spectra. Our very first compound, hexanedioic acid, has the simple NMR spectrum shown here. The first question is why only three peaks for six carbon atoms? This is because of the symmetry of the molecule. The two carboxylic acids are identical and give one peak at 174 ppm. For the same reason C2 and C5 are identical, and C3 and C4 are identical.
These are all in the saturated region, but the carbons next to the electron withdrawing carboxyl group will be more deshielded than the others. So, we assign C2 and C5 to the peak at 33 ppm and C3 and C4 to the peak at 24 ppm. This spectrum was run in a different solvent, dimethyl sulfoxide. Hence, the brown solvent peaks are in a different region and have a different form. Again, we will deal with this later. Heptan 2 on is the B pheromone mentioned earlier. It has no symmetry, so all its seven carbon atoms are different. The carbonyl group is easy to identify at 208 ppm, but the rest are more difficult. The two carbon atoms next to the carbonyl group come at lowest field, while C7 is at the highest field at 13 ppm. It is important that there is the right number of signals at about the right chemical shift. If that is so, we are not worried if we cannot assign each frequency to a precise carbon atom, such as atoms 4, 5, and 6. As I said before, do not be concerned with the intensities of the peaks in carbon NMR. Here is the carbon NMR spectrum of butylated hydroxytoluene, BHT, which is a well-known antioxidant. The first surprise in its NMR spectrum is that there are only seven signals for the 15 carbon atoms. There is obviously a lot of symmetry. In fact, the molecule has a plane of symmetry vertically as it is drawn here, and the colored blobs indicate pairs or groups of carbons related to each other by symmetry which therefore give only one signal. The very strong signal at 30 ppm belongs to the six identical methyl groups on the tert butyl groups, and the other two signals in the 0 to 50 ppm range are the methyl group at C4 and the brown central carbons of the tert butyl groups. In the aromatic region, there are only four signals as the two halves of the molecule are the same. As with the last example, we are not concerned with exactly which is which, we just check that there are the right number of signals with the right chemical shifts. Paracetamol is a familiar painkiller with a simple structure. It also is a phenol, but in addition it carries an amide substituent on the benzene ring. Its NMR spectrum contains one saturated carbon atom at 24 ppm corresponding to the methyl group of the amide side chain, one carbonyl group at 168 ppm, and four other peaks at 115, 122, 132, and 153 ppm. These are the carbons of the benzene ring. The two halves of the benzene ring must be the same, so we have only one signal for each pair of carbons colored red and green. This also tells us that the amide substituent does not really lie just to one side as shown here, but rotates rapidly, meaning that on average the two sides of the ring are indistinguishable, as in the previous example. You may ask, why is one of these aromatic peaks in the carbonyl group region at 153 ppm? Well, this must be C4 as it is bonded to oxygen, a reminder that carbonyl groups are not the only unsaturated carbon atoms bonded to oxygen. Proton NMR spectra are recorded in the same way as carbon NMR spectra. Radio waves are used to study the energy level differences of nuclei, but this time they are hydrogen 1 and not carbon 13 nuclei. Like carbon-13, hydrogen-1 nuclei have a nuclear spin of one-half, and so have two energy levels. They can be aligned either with or against the applied magnetic field. Here, as an example, is the proton NMR spectrum of acetic acid. The carbon NMR spectrum is shown below. Proton NMR spectra have many similarities with carbon NMR spectra. The scale runs from right to left, and the zero point is given by the same reference compound. Though it is the proton resonance of tetramethylsilane rather than the carbon resonance that defines the zero point. However, as you immediately see in the spectrum above, the scale is much smaller, ranging over only about 10 ppm instead of the 200 ppm needed for carbon. This makes perfect sense. The variation in the chemical shift is a measure of the shielding of the nucleus by the electrons around it. There is inevitably less change possible in the distribution of two electrons around a hydrogen nucleus than in that of the eight valence electrons around a carbon nucleus. Nonetheless, the acetic acid spectrum above shows you that, just as you would expect, the hydrogen atom of the carboxyl group, directly attached to an oxygen atom, 
is more deshielded than the hydrogen atoms of acetic acid's methyl group. We can also divide up the proton NMR spectrum into regions that parallel the regions of the carbon NMR spectrum. Hydrogen atoms bonded to saturated carbon atoms appear in the right hand, more shielded region of the spectrum, while those bonded to unsaturated carbon atoms, alkenes, aurents, or carbonyl groups, appear in the left hand. Less shielded region between 10 and 5 ppm. As with the carbon NMR spectrum, Nearby oxygen atoms withdraw electron density and make the signals appear towards the left-hand end of each of these regions. You can see exactly how proton NMR signals fall into these regions in the following collection of spectra. The first two spectra each contain only one peak because every proton in benzene and in cyclohexane is identical. In benzene, the peak is at 7.5 ppm, where we expect a proton attached to an unsaturated carbon atom to lie. While in cyclohexane, it is at 1.35 ppm because all the cyclohexane protons are attached to saturated carbon atoms. Again, to help comparisons, I have also included the carbon NMR spectra of benzene and cyclohexane. For benzene, the signal falls in the unsaturated carbon region at 129 ppm, while for cyclohexane, it is in the saturated carbon region at 27 ppm. Tert-butyl methyl ether is a solvent and fuel additive whose proton NMR spectrum illustrates the effect of a nearby oxygen atom. The large peak at 1.1 ppm comes from the nine hydrogen atoms making up three identical methyl groups of the tert-butyl part of the molecule, while the three hydrogen atoms of the methyl part of the ether are at 3.15 ppm. These three hydrogen atoms are all bonded directly to a carbon atom, which itself is bonded to oxygen, whose electronegativity attracts their electrons, deshielding the hydrogen nuclei and shifting them to larger chemical shift. The plane of symmetry I noted in the carbon NMR spectrum of BHT means that the proton NMR spectrum of the related fuel additive, topanol 354, is relatively simple considering it has 26 hydrogen atoms. The large peak between 2 and 1 ppm corresponds to the 18 protons of the tert-butyl groups. Additionally, at around 4 ppm, the signal appears for the protons from the methoxy group, while the proton directly attached to the oxygen of the hydroxyl group shows up as a broad signal between 6 and 5 ppm. The symmetry in the molecule ensures that the two protons in the ring are identical, and the signal around 7 ppm corresponds to the aromatic hydrogens, as indicated in green. Proton NMR exhibits many more features, which we will set aside for the moment. It is no exaggeration to say that, in general, proton NMR is more critical for the routine determination of structure than all the other methods combined. We will revisit proton NMR in more detail in a separate module. To illustrate the power of NMR, Consider these three alcohols with the formula C4H10O, each exhibiting a distinct carbon NMR spectrum. The peaks from the spectra are presented in the table below. In each alcohol, a saturated carbon atom adjacent to oxygen appears in the typical region for saturated carbon atoms next to electron withdrawing groups. Next, there are carbons located one atom away from oxygen, situated in the 0 to 50 ppm region with their positions at the low field end, due to deshielding by the nearby oxygen atom. Two of the alcohols have carbon separated from the oxygen atom by two carbon atoms. They are only slightly shielded and appear around 20 ppm. Only inbutanol, however, has a more remote carbon located at 15.2 ppm. Here, the number and chemical shift of the signals distinctly identify the isomer structures from each other. A common situation chemists find themselves in is that they have some idea about a molecular formula from high-resolution mass spectrometry and need to match a structure to NMR data. Here is an example. The formula, C3H6O, is represented by seven reasonable structures. The three carbon NMR spectra shown here represent three of these compounds. The challenge is to identify which three. Simple symmetry can distinguish structures A, C, and E from the rest as these three have only two types of carbon atom. The two carbonyl compounds, D and E, 
will have one peak in the 150 to 200 ppm region, but compound E has two different saturated carbon atoms while compound E has only one. The two alkenes, F and G, both have two unsaturated carbon atoms that should appear between 100 and 200 ppm. But in ether G, one of them is connected to oxygen. You would expect it, therefore, to be deshielded and to appear between 150 and 200 ppm. The three saturated compounds, A, B, and C, present the greatest problem. The epoxide B has two different carbon atoms next to oxygen and one normal saturated carbon atom. The remaining two should both have one signal in the 0 to 50 ppm region and one in the 50 to 100 ppm region, and only the more powerful techniques of proton NMR and, to a certain extent, infrared spectroscopy will distinguish them reliably. The only carbonyl compound with two identical carbons is acetone, so spectrum. One must be that one. Notice the very low field signal at 206 ppm, typical of a simple ketone carbonyl carbon atom. Spectrum 2 has two unsaturated carbons and a saturated carbon next to oxygen, so it must be F or G. In fact, it has to be compound F as both unsaturated carbons are similar, and neither is next to oxygen. Remember, unsaturated carbon next to oxygen appears at around 150 ppm. This leaves spectrum 3, which appears to have no carbon atoms next to oxygen as all chemical shifts are less than 50 ppm. However, the two signals at 48 and 48.2 ppm are suspiciously close to the arbitrary 50 ppm borderline. They are, of course, both next to oxygen, and this must be compound B. To summarize, in this lecture, we learned about the regions where typical functional groups appear in carbon and proton NMR spectra. Using specific examples, you saw how this information can be used for the determination of the structure of organic molecules. The following lecture will introduce the basic principles of infrared spectroscopy and its use in identifying common functional groups in organic compounds. Thank you for your attention. Greetings to all, and welcome back to the module devoted to determining the structure of organic molecules. So far, you have been introduced to X-ray crystallography, mass spectrometry, and NMR spectroscopy. X-ray crystallography provides us with useful information about the shape of organic molecules. Carbon and proton NMR spectra tell us a lot about the hydrocarbon skeleton of a molecule, while mass spectrometry weighs the molecule as a whole. However, none of these techniques reveal much about functional groups. Some functional groups, such as carbon-oxygen double bonds or unsaturated systems, can be seen in the carbon NMR spectrum because they contain carbon atoms. However, many, such as ethers or nitro groups, cannot be seen at all by NMR. They only show their presence by the way they affect the chemical shifts of nearby hydrogen or carbon atoms. Infrared IR spectroscopy, however, provides a direct way of observing these functional groups because it detects the stretching and bending of bonds rather than any property of the atoms themselves. It is particularly good at detecting the stretching of unsymmetrical bonds of the kind found in functional groups such as OH, carbonyl, amino, and nitro. For this reason, IR spectroscopy complements NMR beautifully as a method for structural analysis. NMR requires electromagnetic waves in the radio wave region of the spectrum to make nuclei flip from one state to another. The amount of energy needed for stretching and bending individual bonds, while still very small, is greater and corresponds to much shorter wavelengths. These wavelengths lie in the infrared region, just to the long wavelength side of visible light. When the carbon skeleton of a molecule vibrates, all the bonds stretch and relax in combination and these absorptions are unhelpful. However, some bonds stretch independently of the rest of the molecule, and we can use these to identify functional groups. This occurs if the bond is either much stronger or weaker than others nearby or between atoms that are much heavier or lighter than their neighbors. In other words, stronger bonds vibrate faster, and so do lighter atoms. The relationship between the frequency of the bond vibration 
the mass of the atoms, and the strength of the bond is essentially the same as Hooke's law for a simple harmonic oscillator. Hooke's law describes the movement of two masses attached to a spring. You may have met it if you have studied physics. You need not be concerned here with its derivation, just the result. It takes the form presented here where ν is the frequency, F is the force constant, μ is the reduced mass, and C is a constant needed to make the units work. Hooke's law shows that the frequency of the vibration is proportional to the square root of a force constant or the bond strength. It is inversely proportional to the square root of a reduced mass, that is, the product of the masses of the two atoms forming the bond divided by their sum. Precise maths is less important to us as chemists than the simple result. Infrared spectra are simple absorption spectra. The sample is dissolved in a solvent or sometimes deposited on the surface of an inert sodium chloride plate and exposed to infrared radiation. The wavelength scanned across the spectrum and the amount of infrared energy able to pass through the sample are plotted against the wavelength of the radiation. Just to make the numbers work out nicely, IR spectra do not usually indicate the wavelength but instead a value known as the wave number, which is simply the number of wavelengths in one centimeter. For a typical bond, this will fall between 4,000 and 500. For 1,000 corresponds to short wavelengths or high frequency, while 500 represents long wavelengths or low frequency. Strong bonds and light atoms vibrate fast, so you expect to see these bonds at the high wave number end of the spectrum, always plotted at the left-hand end. To illustrate what I mean, here are some typical values for the IR frequencies of a selection of bonds grouped in two ways. Firstly, we have a series of bonds to increasingly heavy atoms. Deuterium has twice the mass of protium, and chlorine has about twice the mass of oxygen. Secondly, we have a series of bonds of increasing strength. Here is the IR spectrum of a chemical called cyanoacetamide. Notice that the wave number scale runs from high to low, but also that absorption maxima are shown upside down. You might say that IR spectra are upside down and back to front. If you look carefully, you will also see that the scale changes in the middle to give more space to the more detailed right-hand half of the spectrum. The overall shape of the spectrum is characteristic for cyanoacetamide, but as chemists we need to be able to interpret the spectrum, and we can do this by dividing it up into regions, just as we did with the NMR spectra. There are four important regions of the IR spectrum. The first region, from 4,000 to 3,000, is the region for CH, NH, and OH bond stretching. Most of the atoms in an organic molecule, including carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, are about the same weight. Hydrogen is an order of magnitude lighter than any of these, and so it dominates the stretching frequency by the large effect it has on the reduced mass, so any bond to hydrogen comes right at the left-hand end of the spectrum. Even the strongest bonds between non-hydrogen atoms, such as triple bonds between two carbons or carbon and nitrogen, absorb at slightly lower frequencies than bonds to hydrogen. These are in the next region, the triple bond region from about 3,000 to 2,000. This and the other two regions of the spectrum follow in logical order of bond strength as the reduced masses are all about the same. Carbon-carbon and carbon-oxygen double bonds appear around 2,000 to 1,500, and at the right-hand end of the spectrum come single bonds, below 1,500. Looking back at the spectrum of cyanoacetamide, we see peaks in the XH region at about 3,600 and 3,200, which are the NH and CH stretches of the amino and CH2 groups. The one rather weak peak in the triple bond region is the nitrile group, and the strong peak at about 1,670 belongs to the carbonyl group. I will explain soon why some IR peaks are stronger than others. The rest of the spectrum is in the single bond region. This region is not normally interpreted in detail but is characteristic of the compound as a whole rather in the way that a fingerprint is characteristic of an individual human being. It is therefore called the fingerprint region. The useful information from this spectrum is the presence of the nitrile and carbonyl groups and the exact position of the carbonyl absorption. The reduced masses of the CH, NH, and OH combinations are all about the same. Any difference between the positions of the IR signals of these bonds must then be due to bond strength. In practice, 
CH stretches occur at around 3,000, although they are of little use in identifying compounds, as it is a rare organic compound that has no CH bonds. NH stretches occur at about 3,300, and OH stretches appear even higher at around 3,500. We can immediately deduce that the OH bond is stronger than NH, which in turn is stronger than CH bonds. This may be surprising as you may be used to thinking of OH bond as more reactive. This is of course true, but factors other than bond strength control reactivity. Bond strengths will be much more important when we discuss radical reactions. The form of the absorption signals resulting from X-H infrared stretches can be very different. For instance, the IR peak of an NH group looks different from that of an NH2 group. A bond gives an independent vibration only if both bond strength and reduced mass are different from those of neighboring bonds. In the case of an isolated NH group, this is likely to be true, and we usually get a sharp peak at about 3,300, whether the NH group is part of a simple amine or an amide. The NH2 group is also independent of the rest of the molecule, but the two NH bonds inside the NH2 group have identical force constants and reduced masses, and so vibrate as a single unit. As a result, two equally strong bands appear, one for the two NH bonds vibrating in phase, alternatively denoted as symmetric, and one for the two NH bonds vibrating in opposition, often called anisymmetric. The anisymmetric vibration requires more energy and is at slightly higher frequency. OH groups occur at higher frequency, sometimes as a sharp absorption at about 3,600. More often you will see a broad absorption at anywhere from 3,500 to 2,900. This is because OH groups form strong hydrogen bonds that vary in length and strength. Hydrogen bonds are weak bonds formed from electron-rich atoms such as oxygen or nitrogen to hydrogen atoms also attached by normal bonds to the same sorts of atoms. Here are presented hydrogen bonds between two molecules of an alcohol and an acid. The solid line represents the normal bond and the green dotted line the longer hydrogen bond. The hydrogen atom is about a third of the way along the distance between the two oxygen atoms. A sharp absorption at 3,600 indicates a non-hydrogen bonded OH group in a phenol. In contrast, the lower the absorption frequency, the stronger the hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonds slightly weaken the true covalent OH bonds by varying amounts. When a bond varies in length and strength, it will have a range of stretching frequencies distributed about a mean value. Alcohols, including the phenols shown, typically give a rounded absorption at about 3,300. This contrasts with the sharp shape of the NH stretch in the same region you saw earlier. Carboxylic acids also form hydrogen-bonded dimers with two strong hydrogen bonds between the carbonyl oxygen atom of one molecule and the acidic hydrogen of the other. These also vary considerably in length and strength and usually give the very broad V-shaped absorbance you see in the benzoic acid IR spectrum. The spectra of paracetamol and butylated hydroxytoluene illustrate the effect of hydrogen bonding on the peak shape. Paracetamol has a typical sharp peak at 3330 for the NH stretch, and then a rounded absorption for the hydrogen-bonded OH stretch from 3300 down to 3000, just in the gap between the NH and CH stretches. By contrast, Butylated hydroxytoluene, or BHT, has a sharp absorption at 3,600 as the two large tert butyl groups prevent the typical hydrogen bond from forming. You may be confused the first time you see the IR spectrum of a terminal alkyne, as you will see a strong sharp peak at around 3,300 that looks just like an NH stretch. The spectrum of methylpropylate illustrates this. The displacement of this peak from the usual CH stretch cannot be due to a change in the reduced mass and must be due to a marked increase in bond strength. The alkyne CH bond is shorter and stronger than alkane CH bonds. Carbon uses an sp3 orbital to make a CH bond in a saturated structure, but has to use an sp orbital for a terminal alkyne CH bond. This orbital has one half s character instead of one quarter s character in an sp3 orbital. The electrons in an s orbital are held closer to the carbon's nucleus than in a p orbital, 
therefore the sp orbital makes for a shorter and stronger CH bond. The triple bond region is often empty, meaning that when you do see a peak between 2000 and 2500, you can be certain that the compound is an alkyne or a nitrile. Methylpropylate and cyanoacetamide, illustrated earlier, are representative examples demonstrating characteristic IR stretches for carbon-carbon and carbon-nitrogen triple bonds. The most important absorptions in the double bond region are those of the carbonyl, alkene or arene, and nitro groups. All give rise to sharp IR stretches. The carbonyl group gives one strong stretch anywhere between 1900 and 1500. Alkene carbon carbon double bond gives one weak band at about 1640. And the nitro group gives two intense signals in the mid 1500s and mid 1300s. RNs usually give two or three signals in the region between 1600 and 1500. Several of these features are illustrated in the IR spectrum of 4 nitrosinamaldehyde. Why the nitro group gives two bands is easily understood. Just as with NH2, it is a matter of how many identical bonds are present in the same functional group. Carbonyl and alkene clearly have one double bond each. The nitro group at first sight appears to contain two different groups, but delocalization means they are identical, and we see absorption for symmetric and anisymmetric stretching vibrations. As with NH2, more energy is associated with the anisymmetric vibration, and it occurs at higher frequency. Aromatic systems, being rings, have a much more complex pattern of vibration that cannot be analyzed simply. However, it is worth noting that arene carbon carbon double bonds come at lower frequency than alkene bonds. The reason is that the individual carbon carbon bonds in benzene are, of course, not full double bonds. All six bonds are the same and have the average character of one and a half bonds each. Not surprisingly, the absorptions of these bonds fall right on the boundary between the single and double bond regions. You have already seen the IR spectra of several carbonyl compounds. It is easy to identify the carbonyl peak in each spectrum as these peaks are always intense and come somewhere near 1700. Why the positions of the peaks vary, and what we can make of this information, will be discussed in a separate module. If you look back at the XH regions of the spectra described earlier, you will notice something that at first sight seems odd. The NH and OH absorptions are stronger than the CH absorptions, despite there being more CH bonds in these molecules than OH or NH bonds. The reason for this is that the strength of an IR absorption varies with the change of dipole moment when the bond is stretched. Dipole moment depends on the variation in distribution of electrons along the bond and its length, which is why stretching a bond can change its dipole moment. For bonds between unlike atoms, the larger the difference in electronegativity, the greater the dipole moment, and the more it changes when stretched. For identical atoms, the dipole moment, and its capacity to change with stretching, is much smaller. If the bond is perfectly symmetrical, there is no change in dipole moment, and there is no IR absorption. Obviously, the carbon-carbon double bond is less polar than either carbon-oxygen or nitrogen-oxygen double bonds and therefore carbon-carbon double bond absorption is less intense in the IR. Indeed, it may be absent altogether in a symmetrical alkene. By contrast, the carbonyl group is very polarized, with oxygen attracting the electrons away from carbon and stretching it causes a large change in dipole moment. Therefore, Carbonyl stretches are usually the strongest peaks in the IR spectrum. OH and NH stretches are stronger than CH stretches as CH bonds are only weakly polarized. The region below 1500 is where the single bond vibrations occur. Here, our hope that individual bonds may vibrate independently of the rest of the molecule is usually doomed to disappointment. The carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen atoms all have about the same atomic weight and carbon carbon carbon-nitrogen, and carbon-oxygen single bonds all have about the same strength. In addition, carbon-carbon bonds are often joined to other carbon-carbon bonds with virtually identical strength and reduced mass, and they have essentially no dipole moments. The only one of these single bonds of any value is carbon-oxygen bond, which is polar enough to show up as a strong absorption at about 1100. Some other single bonds, such as carbon-chlorine, are quite useful at about 700.
Otherwise, the single bond region is usually crowded with hundreds of absorptions from vibrations of all kinds used as a fingerprint characteristic of the molecule but not really open to interpretation. A matching fingerprint is used to link a suspect to a crime, but you cannot interpret a fingerprint to deduce the height, weight, or eye color of a criminal. Likewise with the fingerprint region, a matching fingerprint confirms that two compounds are identical, but without a suspect, you have to rely on the rest of the spectrum, above 1500, for analysis. Among those hundreds of peaks in the fingerprint region, there are some of a quite different kind. Stretching is not the only bond movement that leads to IR absorption. Bending of bonds, particularly CH and NH bonds, also leads to quite strong peaks, which are called deformations. Bending a bond is easier than stretching it. Consequently, bending absorptions need less energy and come at lower frequencies than stretching absorptions for the same bonds. These bands may not often be useful in identifying molecules, but you will notice them as they are often strong. For instance, deformations in the fingerprint region are usually stronger than carbon-carbon double bond stretches. To sum it up, in this lecture, you were introduced to the main concepts of IR spectroscopy. You have learned about the most important regions in IR where the most common functional groups appear. We saw that the position of the signal from a bond depends on the reduced mass of atoms and bond strength. Light atoms and strong bonds give high-frequency signals. The strength and intensity of the signal in IR depend on the change in dipole moment, as bonds with a large dipole moment give strong absorption. Finally, the width of the signal depends on hydrogen bonding. The presence of strong hydrogen bonding gives a broad peak, and vice versa. The final lecture in this module will focus on the combination of several spectroscopic techniques in determining the structure of organic molecules. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, and welcome to the concluding lecture in the module on determining the structure of organic molecules. The previous lectures focused on the main principles of X-ray crystallography used to determine bond lengths and angles, mass spectrometry, for determining the mass of the molecule and atomic composition, and nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which provides information about symmetry, branching, and connectivity in the molecule. I also provided an introduction to infrared spectroscopy, which is used to identify the functional groups in organic compounds. If the physico-chemical methods we learned so far are each as powerful as we have seen on their own, how much more effective they must be together. We shall finish this module with the identification of some simple unknown compounds using all three methods. The first is an industrial emulsifier used to blend solids and liquids into smooth pastes. Its electrospray mass spectrum shows it has M plus H with a mass of 90, so an odd molecular weight, 89, suggests one nitrogen atom in the molecule of the unknown industrial emulsifier. High-resolution mass spectrometry reveals that the formula is C4H11NO. The carbon NMR spectrum has only three peaks, so two of the carbon atoms must be identical, meaning that we have a symmetry in the molecule. There is one signal for saturated carbon next to oxygen, and two for other saturated carbons, one more downfield than the other. The IR spectrum reveals a broad peak for an OH group with two sharp NH2 peaks just protruding. If we put this together, we know that we have an alcohol subunit and an amino group in the emulsifier. Neither of the carbons connected to oxygen and nitrogen can be duplicated as there is only one oxygen and only one nitrogen according to HRMS. So, it must be the other two carbon atoms that are identical. The next stage is one often overlooked. We do not seem to have much information, but try and put the two fragments together knowing the molecular formula, and there is very little choice. The carbon chain, shown in red, could either be linear or branched, and that is it. There is no room for double bonds or rings because we need to fit in the 11 hydrogen atoms. We cannot put nitrogen or oxygen in the chain because we know from the IR that we have the groups OH and NH2, which can each be joined only to one other group. Of the seven possibilities, only the last two, A and B, 
are possible since they alone have two identical carbon atoms, the two methyl groups in each case. All the other structures would have four separate signals in the NMR. So, how can we choose between these two? The solution is in the proton NMR spectrum, which is shown here. There are only two sharp peaks available, one at 3.3 and one at 1.1 ppm. It is quite common in proton NMR spectra not to see sharp signals for protons attached to oxygen or nitrogen. You will see why in a later module. So, we can again rule out all structures with more than two different types of hydrogen attached to carbon. The chemical shift of the signal at 3.3 ppm tells us more. It has to be from hydrogen atoms next to an oxygen atom because it is more deshielded. The industrial emulsifier must therefore be structure A corresponding to 2 amino 2 methylpropanol. The industrial emulsifier was fully saturated. It is usually helpful in deducing the structure of an unknown compound if once you know the atomic composition, you immediately work out how much unsaturation there is. It may seem obvious to you that, as C4H11NO has no double bonds, then C4H9NO must have one double bond as we are losing two hydrogen atoms. Similarly, the compound with a molecular formula, C4H7NO, must have two double bonds, and so on. In reality, it is not quite as simple as that. Some possible structures for this formula are shown here. Some of these structures have the right number of double bonds, one has a triple bond, and three compounds use rings as an alternative way of losing some hydrogen atoms. Each time you make a ring or a double bond, you have to lose two more hydrogen atoms. Therefore, in spectroscopy, double bonds of all kinds and rings are called double bond equivalents. You can work out how many double bond equivalents there are in a given atomic composition just by making a drawing of one possible structure for the formula. Other possible structures for the same formula will have the same number of double bond equivalents. Alternatively, you can calculate the double bond equivalents if you wish. A saturated hydrocarbon with N carbon atoms has two N plus two hydrogens. Oxygen does not make any difference to this. There are the same number of hydrogens in a saturated ether or alcohol as in a saturated hydrocarbon. So, for a compound containing carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen only, take the actual number of hydrogen atoms away from 2N plus 2 formula and divide the result by 2. Just to check that it works, for the unsaturated ketone with a molecular formula, C7H12O, the calculation becomes as follows. The maximum number of hydrogen atoms for 7 carbons is 16. Then, we subtract the actual number of hydrogen atoms from the maximum number for 7 carbons. That gives us 4. In the end, we divide the number we obtained by 2 to get the double bond equivalents, which in this case will be 2. Using the same method, we will find that the chemical with a general formula, C7H10O2, has three double bond equivalents and it must have one alkene subunit, one carbonyl group, and a ring. Similarly, the chemical with a general formula, C7H8O, has four double bond equivalents, meaning that it has three double bonds and a ring, which will give us the aromatic ether called onisole. A benzene ring always gives four double bond equivalents, three for the double bonds and one for the ring. Nitrogen makes a difference. Every nitrogen adds one extra hydrogen atom because nitrogen can make three bonds. This means that the formula becomes as follows. For calculation of the double bond equivalents, we subtract the actual number of hydrogens from 2N plus 2, add one for each nitrogen atom, and divide the result by 2. Here are some example structures of compounds with seven carbon atoms, one nitrogen, and an assortment of unsaturation and rings. If we now fill in the numbers for the saturated nitro compound in the formula for working out the number of double bond equivalents in nitrogen compounds, we will find that the double bond equivalents in the saturated nitro compound is 1. And that corresponds to the nitrogen-oxygen double bond. I leave the third and fourth examples for you to work out, but the last compound, called 4-dimethylaminopyridine or DMAP, has 7 carbon atoms, meaning that the maximum number of hydrogen atoms will be 16. 
We then subtract the actual number of hydrogen atoms and add the number of nitrogens, which gives us 8. Dividing 8 by 2 provides the double bond equivalents, which are 4 in this case. For the molecular formula C7H10N2, there are indeed three double bonds and a ring, making four double bond equivalents in all. Make sure that you can do these sorts of calculations without much trouble. Do not confuse this calculation with the observation we made about mass spectra that the molecular weight of a compound containing one nitrogen atom must be odd. This observation and the number of double bond equivalents are, of course, related, but they are different calculations made for different purposes. If you have other elements too, it is simpler just to draw a trial structure and find out how many double bond equivalents there are. You may prefer this method for all compounds as it has the advantage of giving you one possible structure before you really start. One good tip is that if you have few hydrogens relative to the number of carbon atoms, then there is probably an aromatic ring in the compound. Knowing the number of double bond equivalents for a formula derived by high-resolution mass spectrometry is a quick shortcut to generating some plausible structures. You can then rule them in or rule them out by comparing with IR and NMR data. Our last example addresses a situation very common in chemistry that is working out the structure of a product of a reaction. The situation is this. You have treated acrolein with hydrobromic acid and glycol as solvent for one hour at room temperature. Distillation of the reaction mixture gives a colorless liquid, and you are tasked to identify the structure of the product. The mass spectrum shows a molecular ion at 181, much heavier than that of the starting material, which is 56. Indeed, it shows two molecular ions at 181 and 179, typical of a bromo compound. So it looks as if hydrobromic acid has added to the aldehyde somehow. High-resolution mass spectrometry reveals a formula of C5H9 bromo 2, and the five carbon atoms make it look as though the glycol has also added to the molecule of acrolein. If we add everything together, we find that the unknown compound is the result of the three reagents added together with the loss of one molecule of water. It is often very helpful when you have an unknown product, to subtract the molecular mass of the starting material from its molecular mass to find out what has been added or taken away. Now, how many double bond equivalents do we have? With a formula like this, the safest bet is to draw something that fits with the molecular formula. It need not be what you expect the product to be. Here is something that corresponds to the molecular formula. Accordingly, our product should have one double bond equivalent. The next thing is to see what remains of the hydrocarbon skeleton of acrolein by NMR. The carbon NMR spectrum of acrolein clearly shows one carbonyl group and two carbons on the double bond region. These have all disappeared in the product, and for the five carbon atoms we are left with four signals. Two of these signals are saturated, one is next to oxygen, and one is at 102 ppm, just creeping into the double bond region. The IR spectrum gives us another puzzle. There appear to be no functional groups at all. No OH, no carbonyl, no alkene. What else can we have? The answer is an ether, or rather two ethers, as there are two oxygen atoms. Now that we suspect an ether, we can look for the carbon-oxygen single bond stretch in the IR spectrum and find it at 1128. Each ether oxygen must have a carbon atom on each side of it but we seem to have only one carbon next to oxygen in the saturated region of carbon NMR. Of course, as you have already seen, these limits are arbitrary, and in fact the peak at 102 ppm is also a saturated carbon next to oxygen. It is unlikely to be an alkene anyway as it takes two carbons to make an alkene. You might ask, what would deshield a saturated carbon as much as this? The answer is two oxygen atoms. We can explain the carbon NMR spectrum if we assume a symmetrical fragment that accounts for three of the five carbon atoms. So, where is our double bond equivalent? From the NMR and IR spectra, we know that we do not have a double bond, neither an alkene nor a carbonyl. Therefore, the double bond equivalent must be a ring. You might feel uncomfortable with rings, but you must get used to them. Five, six, and seven membered rings are very common. In fact, most known organic compounds have rings in them. 
it is much more likely that the basic skeletons of the organic reagents are preserved, that is, in the product. We should have a 2-carbon unit coming from the ethylene glycol and a 3-carbon unit derived from the acrolein fragment joined through oxygen atoms. This gives four possibilities, all containing the fragment we deduced earlier from carbon NMR spectroscopy. These are all quite reasonable, although we might prefer the third, as it is easier to see how it derives from the reagents without breaking the carbon-carbon skeletons. The product is, in fact, this third possibility, and to be sure, we would have to turn to the fine details of proton NMR spectroscopy, which we will return to in a separate module. In summary, we have only begun to explore the intricate world of identifying structures through spectroscopy. It is important that you recognize that structures are assigned not because of some theoretical reason or because a reaction ought to give a certain product, but because of sound evidence from spectra. In this module, you have encountered four powerful methods, mass spectra, carbon and proton NMR, and IR spectroscopy. In a separate module, we will delve more deeply into the most important of all, proton NMR, and later, I will take each of these methods a little further to show how the structures of more complex unknown compounds are deduced. The last problem we have discussed here is not really solvable without proton NMR, and in reality, no one would tackle any structure problem without this most powerful of all technique. From now on, spectroscopic evidence will appear in virtually every module. Even if I do not explicitly say so, every time a new compound appears, the structure of this compound will, in fact, have been determined spectroscopically. Chemists make new compounds, and every time they do, they characterize the compound with a full set of spectra. No scientific journal will accept that a new compound has been made unless a full description of all these spectra is submitted with the report. Spectroscopy lets the science of organic chemistry advance. Thank you for your attention and participation.